In this session, I want to talk to you about how you get to the essence of the problem. I'm using the term essence to mean the logical core of anything. Where we are in the scheme of things is that uh, we can find a solution to almost any problem. We've got the technology to do anything we like, but finding a solution to the problem, the problem is that we don't always know what the problem is. And so we fail much more often because we solve the wrong problem than because we get the wrong solution to the right problem. Uh, even the great Albert Einstein said, if I had an hour to save the world, I would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute finding a solution. And I'd like to urge you to keep these words in mind because uh, the more time you spend looking at the problem, the better your solution is going to be. Because it really doesn't matter how good your solution is. If it doesn't meet the real business need, it is a waste of time and money. So regardless of the glitzy technology, it has to solve the right problem. And I want to talk about that. Now, there's a difference here between the solution and the real need, or I could say a difference between the solution and the requirement. This is a fairly typical situation. I've got a business user saying, I need a new screen to show me all the unfilled orders for the week. You've probably seen or heard something like this, or uh, you've had it happen to you, where you are talking to a stakeholder and they give you a solution rather than need. It's their idea of how to solve that problem. Now, you've got options here. One is you can go ahead and uh, implement exactly what they're asking for, and the chances are, and history tells us this, the chances are it's wrong. The chances are that that was simply a solution to an unstated problem, and that person didn't really understand what the problem was, but was giving you a solution in the hope that uh, you would build something and it would solve the problem. Uh, we know from bitter experience that it doesn't. So you've got to question everything that's being given to you to come up with the essence of the problem as opposed to the first guessed at solution. Looking at the essence of the problem, it's sometimes hidden, well actually it's always hidden because what you see when you look at something is technology. You also see the people who are involved in this work. You see procedures, all these things are observable. You see the organization, you can look at an org chart and so forth. What you can't see is the underlying essence because any piece of work that's being done uh, contains technology, people, procedures, organization, and so forth, but it also contains this core of essential policy, and that's what we're trying to reveal. Now, what I've got to do is to see the essence without the technology, to scrape all that stuff off and see it uh, without its concrete accompaniment. So if I look at the definition of abstraction here. It talks about the process of considering something independently of its associations, attributes, or concrete accompaniment, or to put in our language, to see it without any technology or any uh, solution attached to it. So in order to see the essence, I've got to make some abstractions. Now, we humans are pretty good at abstraction. Here we see a young lad about to reach onto a hot stove, and if he keeps going that way, he's going to burn himself. Now, as a human, he's going to learn not to do that again, but he's also going to learn not to touch anything hot because it's hurt. So it's not the stove to be afraid of. It's not the stove that's going to hurt. It's anything that's hot is going to hurt. And that's an abstraction that we humans can make. Animals can't do that. But as humans, we can make abstractions. So the abstraction I want to make here is, how do I see something without its technological surroundings? Here's another instance of abstraction, a light bulb. You know, you've changed lots of light bulbs. You've made jokes about how many developers it takes to change a light bulb and so forth. Have you ever thought about the screw thread on the bottom of the light bulb? It's officially known as an E27, E for Edison, uh, the inventor of it, and 27 being the number of millimeters in the diameter. Where did that come from? 
Well, the answer is it came from the time that Edison and his engineers were developing the light bulb. And one of the problems they had was how to make the light bulb stand up, to sit up, because you can see here if you screw this into a socket, it's going to sit up and be useful. And at the time, Edison and his uh, colleagues were working in, this was early 1900s, remember, they were working mainly with kerosene lamps, kerosene a flammable liquid, and you would pour it into a lamp like this and light the wick and it would illuminate whatever you were working on. Uh, Edison, of course, was trying to get people to stop using kerosene lamps and use his light bulbs. One night, one of the engineers was filling the kerosene lamp and he noticed that when he was screwing the cap back on the can of kerosene, he began to wonder and he made the abstraction and said, if I can screw the cap onto the can, I can screw something into the cap. In other words, if I turn the whole thing upside down. And so what he did is cut the nozzle, the spout off the can and took the cap and made the cap into a socket and made the spout of the kerosene can the base of the light bulb and bingo, there it is. And it remains unchanged to today. So next time you look at a light bulb, that came from a kerosene can or more importantly, it came from an abstraction, a useful abstraction that the engineer made. When we're getting to the essence of things, we're really asking why something is there. We make abstractions. Uh, for example, why do we have a pencil? What is the underlying reason for using a pencil? Well, the answer is not to write something, because that's still a, a technological thing. But why do we write things down? Well, most of the time we write them down to remember something. We write notes to ourselves. Don't forget to pick up the steak on the way home. Don't forget you've got a meeting at two o'clock. And so we're writing stuff down with a pencil. It's only transient, it's temporary, but it's actually an aid to memory. So the essential purpose here is to remember things. I want to carry on and talk about the brown cow model. Uh, you'll never forget this because there's a lovely picture of this uh, this cow. And the model is a way of looking at something. And I want to use one line to separate what from how. What being the essence of something and the how being the technological way of achieving whatever it is we're looking at. So the technology is below the line. Above the line is the essence of the problem. I want a second line to separate now from the future because when you're looking at your uh, processes, when you're trawling for requirements, investigating the work and so forth, you're looking at something that is there now, but you also want that to be different in the future. So my vertical line is separating now from the future. So in the very first quadrant, I've got how now, uh, which incidentally gives the name to this model. It's called, just in case you were wondering this, it's called the brown cow model because in English elocution, if you're learning to speak correctly or if you remember the play Pygmalion or the movie My Fair Lady, uh, she had to say how now brown cow. So how now being the first quadrant. You didn't need to know that at all, did you? How now being the first quadrant, uh, that's the current implementation of the work or the current uh, technological view of it. If we make an abstraction, if we come to the essence of that, then we move above the line and we say, this is the essence of the work. This is what you would see if you scraped away all the technology, took away the people, the procedures, the organization, all that kind of stuff, ran it through some kind of filter, and all you were left with is the underlying essential policy, then that is the essence of what there is now. But that's not enough. We want to move further and say, what is the essence going to be like in the future? And this is really the most important quadrant of this model because we want to discuss what we want that business to be in any future incarnation. So this is our future policy, if you like, our future essence, uh, what we want that thing to be doing without yet being concerned about the technology. We work with the stakeholders in order to decide the, the new business in the 
uh, the future what. And once to settle, once we've got a very good clear idea of what we want that policy to be, then we come back down below the line and end up with the future how, which is our desired implementation of the essence or our uh, desired way of solving the problem. So just as an example of that, uh, here's Sam's books. Uh, customers drive to the store, go inside and buy a book, pay money. If I look at the essence of that, I've got to scrape away the car, which is a piece of technology, and the store, and all the rest of it. And essentially all it is is a customer is choosing a book to buy. And that's the essence of the bookstore. Now, what do I want the future essence to be? Because I might want to change that. And Sam's come up with the idea that what he wants is for him to predict books and send them to the customer. If he can predict accurately enough, then he'll have a customer for life because rather than having to hunt around for something to read, Sam is supplying the kind of books that customer wants to read. Once we've settled that as being our future what or our future essence, then we say, how are we going to do that? And we'll do that by scanning books in the house, maybe interviewing the people, making the predictions, and then using one of the delivery services in order to get the books out to uh, the particular customer. Now, I arrive at the future technology or the future how. I don't start there. And we must keep that in mind because I really want to make sure that I am solving the right problem, and I'm doing that by spending a certain amount of time above the line thinking about what it is that I'm trying to do, not how I'm going to do it.